So I'm here with Pete. We're in Georgia. We just had barbecue. We're having a beer and a cigar. Long ashes. And as my girlfriend would say, long lashes. Yeah, now if we, we're, we do it together, we got to do long lashes. Because, you know, there you go. So. This is a great place, bro. This is downtown Woodstock, Georgia. My hometown. And we're at the Reformation Brewery. If you haven't come here, what's the name of that barbecue place next door? Queenie's. Queenie's Barbecue. It, it was off the chain. The mac, mac and cheese, brisket, and the coleslaw. I'm having this stout beer. Because you know me, it's bold and big or go home. Reformation Hattie. There you go. And he's having a... Um, this is a Macanudo. CRU Royale. It's a Rocky Patel. Yeah, Rocky Patel. This is a Connecticut. You know, he's going light today. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we're just, you know, shooting the breeze because it's nice and cool, too. It's beautiful out here. When I got here, it was 40-something. I had to acclimate. It was cold. It was cold. 40, I mean, it went down to like 30-something. The lake froze. Yeah, really? Yeah, and I tried to throw, like, onions into the lake to see if it would break the ice. Right. And it just skid across the lake. Oh, dang. Yeah, so I know it went into the tens in the yeah. single digits and below. Just a week, I think, before, and pipes were busting all over the city. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for Georgia, that's not usual? Not for this uh, part? You know, it's like it's like how builders are, right? Like, it, it, we our house is built properly, right? It's like got the, the water lines, it's insulated, and then it goes through the center of the house, and then right. it dispersed through all the rooms where a lot of people's water lines are, like, up against the exterior wall, and it just travels up long. Oh. And so, like, lots of people stuff busted or they're in a um they have like a little overhang in the upstairs and the water lines there but it's not right. insulated because you know building code sucks right around here so so people were busting but we had a um a chlorinator busted that was the only thing okay it's outside yet yeah it's, it's not insulated it's yeah, the yeah. only thing that wasn't insulated so the chlorinator for the pool busted but that was it yeah so i got here but it, it went down into the the i was out smoking a cigar it was like 10 degrees. No, the first night I was here was actually when oh. it got into the light 30s. So it was freezing. It went to freezing temperatures. It went to 32. Yeah, you see you see that green right there in that tree? Yeah. That's mistletoe. Okay. That is from bird poop. Bird eats a, eats a seed. It like, the, the acids in the seed transforms the DNA in that actual seed. And when they poop and it lands on a tree, it comes back to life as mistletoe. So that's what a mistletoe is. That's a mistletoe. So, so you see them all but I'm not going to go under it and kiss you. No, no. No, okay. No, I'm not a touchy guy. Oh, yeah. So, but, uh, oh, what, what I was saying, though, that truck and tap. So if you have a food truck, you have to prep your stuff, like at a commercial facility. Right. And so we got a call, and it was all the way in Decatur to come out and do an inspection at this new facility, which is designed for um, prepping. Yeah, yeah, prepping. Pre they, they bunch of prepping it. station kitchens and so everything. They lease it out by like the hour. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah, and they have like a Department of Ag rep that had an office there and stuff like that. And so we got the bid on it. Right. And, you know, it's all about like opportunities, right? right. It's like looking for opportunities. And so when we uh, when we found that, like, you know, what we were doing, and I d never knew anything about, I knew about the food trucks. I didn't know about the laws that food trucks had to abide by. Right. So then I was like... And so when I heard that, well, that facility, it's the same facility that owns, like, truck and tap and stuff, I was like, wait, I want their numbers, too. Right. And so when I got their numbers and I was like, hey, you know, you, I'm out, um, you know, looking at this facility, I go, um, I can bid on it, but I go, if you have other locations, I go, we can bundle everything and at least drop that price down. Right. You know, or pass the savings or no pass give you the savings but pass the expenses off to in, into the the rent of that facilities and stuff right so we worked out a deal and we were able to get like four locations plus that big old location there right so again it's you know it's all about like opportunities like how far can you take donuts when you, if, you, if you buy donuts how far can you take can you get a coffee roaster shop by bringing them in donuts or can right. you take the coffee roaster facility introduce those two businesses because businesses love the network right and if you have a coffee roaster and you have a donut facility that's almost a natural marriage right so by just introducing people 
um, we were able to like walk in coffee roasters. We were able to walk in the donut facilities, the bourbon place, the breweries, right. all of that stuff. Right. So it's just like a lot of people, what they think is they go, Oh, I got this job and it's one and done. Right. And they don't dig. Right. Right. It's like, so they, they, they look at it and they go, Oh, I get, this is gold, but it's really just pyrite. Right. The gold is where you, you got to dig for it or just ask the proper questions. Right. Right. So, my whole entire facility is like, or my whole entire philosophy is like, you know, it's uh, the sale doesn't stop. It's a foot in a door. Right. And what avenue can you go, and where will that take you? Um, yeah, it's, you it's, generate... a, it's 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 upselling because people when we talk about upselling. Oh, everybody cringes. They hate that word upselling. But 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 I think they're you're you're looking for as a salesperson, you're looking for the opportunity to do something else for the client. Well, upselling yeah. is upselling is one thing, right? And I I hate upselling. Right. Because it's like you're asking for more from a client. Right. Where you're going to provide value if they pay for your service. Right. <laughs> right? In this case, you're, 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 you're networking. You're networking. You're and connecting. You're, and you're using that as, hey, there's an opportunity. Right. You're bringing in more value than right. value is needed. Right. Like right. even like when I found out, I'm like, oh, they're using, they're, they're creating gin now. Right. You know, which... If they were just beer, you know, it'd be interesting to go like, did o Old Fourth Distillery encourage them to go in and start uh, doing the gin? Right. You know, like, is that partnership still there? Right. You know, I mean, you saw like Alma Coffee, right? Yeah. So you got Alma Coffee, you got Reformation, that partnership. Right. right. And was I in the center of it? I, kind of. Right. But, you know, with young professionals of Woodstock and making those connections. Right. And stuff like that, they were able to form a partnership, but I was there to kind of help facilitate right. both ends. Yeah, so you started a, a small group of like young urban professionals? Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, I was part of a right. startup, not like I didn't start it. Right, right. It'd be cool if I had that on my resume, but I was right. part of a group. Right. Where it was like six or seven of us. Is Yuppie still a word? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Is it? I, I'm no longer Yuppie, but you know. Isn't it like I'm a not, Yuppie? Like, I'm, an, I'm an Opie. Nopi? Yeah, an old urban profession. Oh. <laughs> so, but yeah, I just, you know, I think, again, it's like, I just look for opportunities. I think, you know, um, and it's improv all over. That's, you know, um, I did theater work. I did improv. So I performed in front of crowds all the time like right. thinking everything off the cuff but the whole entire concept of improv is if we're connecting one right. then it's like whatever i say you add value don't take away or try to create something you add value and then what you're doing is you're building this story right. of each other adding value and that is like a natural movement where all of a sudden if you say something like no or like i don't that's a form of like negating and people step back and they're like ah, i'm not too you know, comfortable with it. Right. You know, and so the whole entire, you know, improv plays a massive role in, you know, how I communicate or how I uh, sell or even how I market. It's like, where can I add value that makes people feel comfortable and engages them where they're, they come to the edge of their seats, right. you know? Yeah, I've, I've been analyzing a lot of the people that I've been talking to. Um, we've got some, like, serious lineup of people coming in that are all um like your company you, you had at one point 40 employees how many no, the highest i ever had was 44 the but i um i reduced once i went, went to monthly we went down to 38. okay so so but you still had that's an enormous yeah that's it for most people ass. yeah enormous pain in the ass yeah, <laughs> yeah i know and, and, and <laughs> most people don't talk about that uh, you know some people work for the companies that were like that but i just brought on you know pete chopin is on maria uh, coming awesome. on, she's, she's going to be on the second. She's going to be my first podcast in the new year. Nice. So she's done some amazing stuff, um, which I'm really, but I'm I'm looking at people who you would not think these people would be building these kind of companies, um, and and everybody brings what I've analyzed from people is they they're bringing in something from their past that allowed them to be successful somewhere. And then realize, hey, I can use this. Um, you know, Pete was a broadcaster and he was in pest control since he was a kid. Yeah. But a lot of these guys, especially the younger ones, 
you know, they became, they were, they were regional managers. They were branch managers. They understood the business from the backside where most of the people that we deal with that I'm talking to did not. They come from the tech side only and they never get to see the behinds and it's so hard for them to transition that into how do I create a bigger company? And it's hard for them. It's harder. Like me, I never came. I came from sales, marketing, and IT. Or mostly sales and IT. Yeah. Um, and so what I did is, oh, I understood the SEO thing. And I went with that to build my company, to build what I do using the podcasting because I worked in radio and television. So a lot of this stuff for me is just natural. It's not something I really have to work at. Like the SEO, why do I still focus on it so heavily? And people are like... But I understand it. I understand how to compete in my market of 2.1 million, 2.8 million people, 320 pest control companies in one county. Um, and for me, it works. And so I bring all that. And then so you brought your, you look at you from theater and how you can use theater and engagement to, I guess, engage with people and enter into the conversations, enter into oh, yeah, the Yeah, it's in the room, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, reading the room. There you go. So so I think that's unique that and people don't see how they can use their past skills, I guess, for a lot of this. I think that as I'm analyzing more and more entrepreneurs, like Maria comes from a we're gonna get into the discussion, she was an office manager. She understood all the working of the pest control business and then she could like do ten X more for herself. Yeah. No, I I did not understand the pest control industry. I didn't even really understand the business. Right. You know, it's like at all. Like that was, you jump in with an idea and, you know, I used to work with a team. I didn't own a pest control company. I didn't even work in pest control. But in marketing, you work with a team and then there's people in place to where it's like also you become an entrepreneur and it's just you. Right. right. Now you're the owner, the marketer, the technician, the sales, the receptionist. Oh, all, all of it. Yeah. And... It was tough, you know, it was really tough. And it's like, I didn't have the power to hire people um, in my previous career at all. I didn't have that right. um, at all. And so, yeah, it was a massive learning curve. And it's like I did what a lot of other people did, right? It's like I interned with a couple of pest control companies, people who I liked, I kept in touch with. And then I was like, hey, we're growing, come on board. Right. And they're great technicians. Right. Not great office or like um operations managers or right. they're not great you know managers or warehouse managers or anything they're just good at being a technician uh, right. so yeah it was a lot of learning it was a lot of learning it was a lot of reading books it was uh, uh ted talks uh, continue education as far as like business courses and stuff right and uh still to this day i don't know how to build this this it just happens yeah, you know? it, it, what, what a lot of people think is also the misconception is that, oh, you're, you, everybody, I, the, there's two misconceptions, two, I think two extremes in, in, in the building of a business, that anybody can build a multi-million dollar business, and also that the, the, the other thing is, you know, that when you build, you know, these, these big businesses because you understood it all, and you figured, you know, you already, you understood, I think, this is a lot of you know balls to the wall kind of deal where you're just hitting your gun and you're figuring it out as you go and you're learning the next level of, yeah. of where you're at and then, like i have friends who are like man i wish i knew all that corporate stuff I oh, said, Bro, my oh, there it, is. It, it isn't going to help you to know all this corporate stuff i come from corporate you know i was in the c-suite you know i was in a, in a eight billion dollar company and i was like up there in, in the sales um, I, you know, I, my office and the VP of sales were like right there. Um, you know, so I, 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 the corporate stuff is great to understand when you get to that level. It's not very useful when you're, and this is where a lot of the books miss it. I think it's all the business books, um, where they're dealing with companies that are in the multi-million dollar, the corporate game, and they don't understand the, the solopreneurship or that micro business, which is really what we are when you're five you know, you're a million bucks. You're like really a micro business. Yeah. Still, you're not even a, you're not even a small size business compared to the SBA classifications. You're you're really a micro business. Um, 
and and learning all this like I understood how to manage people but I never understood how to hire people right because I never did it but I understood how to manage it you know, I was managing teams of 20 people without a problem um because I'm great with people and I let people do their job and I don't micromanage um, so I'm comfortable in those environments where people are afraid of that I'm not but then again I'm not a marketing guy yeah I learned I'm learning how to be a marketing guy now after 15 years still of doing this I'm now learning how to do a lot of these other things in marketing yeah um, no well I think you know <laughs> the community that's being built on social media has right. been tremendous value yeah now I remember when I first started my pest control company um, and I was taking my wife to work and I was right. taking the vehicle and I was picking her up because we got down to one vehicle because uh, we had staff or I had technicians now and it's like every time I hire someone I got to get rid of my truck <laughs> I'm like yeah you know it's like you grow and then you start back because you got to hire another you grow you start back like that's your yeah that's, that's, a, that's been my experience it's like all of a sudden oh man I'm doing so great I got all this cash flow coming in now but I mean, you lose like 60k just like that yeah because I, because person. I got to go in and now I got to go in 50,000 into you know and the average truck right now is running about 29 plus the add-ons plus things we're at 35k investment plus hiring a guy and all that extra cash is now gone again until that next route starts building yeah and it's always like you're like yeah but you guys are making like a million and you're not making 300,000 um, I'm doing 250,000 a year and I'm pulling in I'm bringing home 150k but if Once you, you hire it, someone yeah yeah oh that was close but yeah it so when I we were like my wife and I when we were like um when I was taking her to work and picking her up like through this transition I, I can't remember which magazine it was it was either the PMP or the PCT okay Mag PMP PCT Pest management. not sponsored should be I was reading one of the articles <laughs> And I could Write find a check. it. Yeah. And I could <laughs> find it. But it had this one article, and it's the one article that I remember out of any of the pest control magazines. It was talking about the green movement. Right. And we were already doing the green. But it was talking about the concept of like business owners not listening to like technicians. Right. Okay. So when I went to go create this natural market or this the natural pest control. I proposed it to three companies that I worked for because I was like, I really don't want to start a business. Pitched it to three organizations. None of them saw value. Right. None of them. This was article, there. yeah, this article was very specific. Like, be open, listening to your technicians. Listen to the people who are interns. Listen to the freaking marketing guy. Like, you know. Listen to the market. Right. Yeah, well, you know, like, <laughs> when I um, filled out my resume, they were like, oh, you're a little overqualified I go yeah I know but I'm learning about the industry I, right you know and I, I gotta be careful because I don't want to say I want to start right you know the industry I go I'm just you know I'm a company man and I'm just tired of talking to six different bosses you know and and so but when I all the ideas that they had they would come and they would pitch to me I'd be like oh that's not the best you know I would maybe take it this way but when I pitched the natural market nobody nobody Right. Nobody wanted a part of it. Yeah. So when I finally started my own, guess what? Like all three organizations, years later, all of a sudden, oh, they got natural division, the green alternative. Yeah, now everybody's, or, every, or, everybody's got or it. Or whatever, right? Yeah. But by then, it's like I've already infiltrated the market right? Um, and dominated that market. Right. And so that article has always stuck with me as far as, like, the best routes. And so when I say, like, it was turf, like... It was a technician that was like, dude, how come we can't be like a turf company in pest control, like where we get like 20 houses in a freaking neighborhood? That would be so much better. Yeah. Because with pest control, it's like you're not getting everybody in one neighborhood. Yeah. Because there's no way to market, really, except that if they're looking for you. Not not, on, not unless you got some deep pocket to do some mic targeted. You could do like those. The door to door. The yeah, those are all connections, right? Yeah. And there's a certain niche that has those connections yeah. that, like, we're yeah. not going to touch yeah. at all. We can't, yeah. you know? Uh, I, I tried doing it in Miami. It's almost impossible um, to do it in Miami because I live I live in a gated community. And there's two gates to get to me. Yeah. You have to go through the main gate, 
and then there's no soliciting signs everywhere and then you have to go through my gate to get to my little community inside gated. there gated yes yes I, I i did gated i didn't want to but you know it was kind of the economic so it was actually worked out better ours was gated at one point yeah until the road <laughs> flooded over and then now we have to have an emergency evac through another neighborhood. So now we just have a ton of traffic that drives through. But uh, yeah, like so, but the technician, and he came from a turf company. Right. And so I pitched the, uh, so when I listened to him and I was like, oh, and I started doing more and more market research, you know, I was like, what year was this, by the way? Can't stop to turn 18. 14 or 13 years ago. Okay, that's about the same time I started dabbling with it. Mine was... Well, that's the turf. You're talking about pest control or... No, no, I mean the whole eco, eco-friendly eco thing. Oh, yeah, so I was like 17, 17, 18 years ago. Yeah, so I started dabbling in that. Um, I, I was at a... Um, I was at my second season. Six, 17 years ago. Okay. Because Ken was a baby when I, I got so you, into so the you've been, you've been in it way, way longer than me. Because I got in, I got into pest control in 2006. In 2007, I went to a CEU training course, and, I, and um, Doc was there. Um, Doc Fisher. Fisher. Oh, okay. He was there, and that was my first exposure to a CEU conference. And then the, he, that was the first thing he said. He says the future of pest control is green. That was in 2007. Seven. Yeah, so he says the future of it, but it, is it was already understand, there. Yeah. Understand, that was my first CU. I had just gotten into the industry as a tech, and everybody in that room laughed. Everybody said no. <laughs> I've had a lot of people laugh. But the whole room, like, this, this yeah. was like, everybody in there was like in the 60s. Like, you know, these are guys that had quit already everything and decided, I'm going to stick with the B&G and just spray apartments. Yeah. And they were like laughing and saying, no, like, you're crazy, oh this will never happen. Like, and that was like, to me... Like reading the room was oh yeah, niche it because so everybody is saying no, I'm gonna look into this and I started and everybody in the every supplier said get it done, every supplier that I had, my my vendor told me it couldn't be done. Couldn't be done. I yeah. sat down with PhDs that were selling biologicals to farms, <laughs> and they said no, nah, it can't be done in residential. We don't have anything labeled. It can't be done. It can't be done. Everybody like no, there can't, has to be a way. I spent the next seven years. Proving it could be done, and then that's when I launched Nature Fest in 2013. I said I'm done with everything else I was doing. Well, hi, <laughs> I was done. You know, I had you know the, the pest control business, the lawn care business, the pool service business, and I said screw it, I'm gonna just go into this. By that time, what I was studying was the the, the organic markets for everything, you know, soaps, and yeah, vegetables, and like when 2007. It was 4% like, when all the manufacturers were saying, like, yeah, everybody says 50% say they want it, but the reality is we're only selling to 4% penetration on all of them. And this was in all the, this was uh, Nielsen studies that I was pulling. Really? Yeah, the Nielsen studies all were showing in 2007. And I said, crap, I can't get into organic pest control. What, so I'll was, get that, murdered. was that Nielsen rating just in pest, like talking about natural no, pest control? No, 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 this was or Nielsen's all organic overall. Overall. And, and what they were in the market penetration right now of all those products at that time was 4% of the marketplace. In other words, the, the publics of the world only sold about to 4% of their customers. Yeah. The shelf was pro, you know, it was like the, 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 what do you call it? The, who's the, the popular, uh, uh, supermarket that does all natural that Trader Joe's whole foods. Oh, well, whole foods. Okay. Yeah. So there wasn't a whole foods in my city, believe it or not in my, there wasn't one. So I, I waited till 2013 until I saw that there was the diffusion of innovation where we're looking at that, there was a 13% market effect. And I said, oh, now I can compete because there was still nobody doing it. There was only one guy in my market doing it. it. So it would be interesting to go like if it was 4%, like if it's 4% of that market, what does that 4% calculate as far as like population wise, right? Right. Because when I look at it and I go, well, 4%, that means I'm capturing 100% of the, that 4%. If yeah. it's 300,000 people, I'm capturing 100%. Yeah. No competitors, right? Yeah. Or if I'm competing against 
just doing pest control. Yeah, that's the way I calculated. Like, yeah. After that, like but I said when 13% market acceptance, pest control in Miami is different because the rest of the country says 20 percent of people use pest control. Therapy. Miami is way less. So I did, didn't do any market research on natural. Okay. At all, I just knew intuitively. Not intuitively. Like so. I when you go to a grocery store right. and you're trying to buy like organic food and right. the products that you want to buy are always out of stock and right. they're like, and they fill those stocks like every other day, I go, there's a complete market here. There's a complete market. And it, it's funny um, because I'm going to, it's, it's stupid. Like it's just ridiculous how stupid it is. So the reason why I got in is because, you know, my son has all these food allergies, has all these huh. environmental health impacts. He got... We had a pest control company that serviced our home. 30 minutes after the service, he had an uh, allergic reaction to the pesticides. Right. And they were using Cypher TC inside the house. Ooh, yeah. I, and I remember it to say, it stinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the following week, he had an allergic reaction to um, at our friend's house, and they just got their carpets clean. So we knew that he had some chemical sensitivities. Right. We knew he already had like food allergies, and it was hard to find soy-based yogurt. They were always out of stock. Right. And where I live, we have six grocery stores all around us. Right. And there, you can never go to any of them. They're always out of stock. <laughs> and I, it would be awesome if they can, like, customize the, their, their inventory and go, like, oh, I need to order a case because right. this guy's going to completely buy it. But what right. they'll buy is, like, 12, and then they'll be gone the next day because right. people do it. And then I was like, and then it was, like, the Tom's uh, uh, toothpaste and stuff would always be out as well. Yeah, I remember studying Tom's yeah. when I was in college and business school in, yeah. in, 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 you know, early 80s. Yeah, Garden of Eden, like, their blue chips would always be out of stock. So I go, and, like, and these are in different uh, stores around us. I go, if they're going this quick, there's a freaking market. And if there is that 4%, I do know this, that, like, no matter what, people are going to pay 30% more if it's a natural product. Why? Because that damn yogurt was almost two bucks. Yeah. Like, it that's, was two yeah, bucks. that's why I've always been 30% more. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's my same conclusion so, I came to. So if I, if, if I still, if I get like the, you know, target that 4% and I'm charging 30%, 35% more than the average competitor or company out there, I'm going to do just fine. Yeah. And so when I broke it down and said, okay, here's what the average, $85 a quarter or whatever, I'm going to have to do this many stops a day which is ridiculous it goes like 14 stops or whatever a day i go but if i price it at like 120 125 i only have to do eight yeah we were doing six to eight yeah yeah eight and we could spend quality time out there yeah now we're up to about 11 <laughs> and do it but we have better route density but through what, that through that with kent what i saw was that there is this movement in natural alternative yeah essential oils you got like young young living doTERRA you got toms you got gardening so, yeah. so there's this massive growth that was happening that you go, okay, we're on the cusp of it. Right. Essentially, it's the same thing with the Christmas light install business. We're yeah. in the cusp of it booming right now. So let's capitalize on it. And so like, so I went pure, in, yeah, pure intuition off of what I surveyed because there wasn't really any data out there as far as like the natural alternative. Yes, there was Whole Foods and stuff. But those were in the hippie, yuppie areas and stuff like that. Not necessarily here. Right. Where ours was just kind of like at a grocery store. It was like two aisles. Like two yeah. tiny aisles. And that was it. Yeah. Um, oh, now I got it. I'm not sure he knows that. I signed it. He just maybe doesn't think into the road. We'll put that. Right. Hey, hey, just put that on yours. Oh, that, 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 that's even better, bro. Yes. I, I'm talking about innovation. I mean, we have no Smart. microphones. We have no microphones, guys. So if, if the audio isn't great, Eric is going to have to work his butt off to make this audio we great. dub over it. Yeah. So No, heck no. We're not recording all this. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, um, we'll hire some voiceover people. Yeah. <laughs> in Spanish or Mandarin. <laughs> We're going to be in foreign countries now doing our podcast. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so it's just by observation... And I went there, but yeah, like, like I told you, like even my chemical rep was like, why, why would you do that? That's stupid. Like you're just going to only, I was like, cause it's going to work. Here, here is the thing where I ran into when talking to my chemical reps, um, that meant when I, when I went in 2006, by 2007, I was already IPM. I started subscribing to all the IPM courses I could take 
And I said, the only thing I can do is do facilities, high level facilities, IPM in a home. Because there were no, I mean, I, I bought the first entire line of, of IC3 of when it came with the Oh, yeah, EcoSmart. Yeah, they, the EcoSmart. They started here in Alpharetta. Okay, I bought the first line. Yeah. And I figured I couldn't control traffic. <laughs> and not in GHP. But then I started doing tests. I said, well, my main business is lawn and ornamental. Yeah. Why don't I start doing organic lawn care and organic, you know, pest control for lawns and where kids are playing in their lawn and all this. And I, that was much easier for me to get into that market. And then I got into IPM. But having the conversation with the reps is that this means I'm going to sell less chemicals. And yeah. every every year, you know, when I talk to somebody, look, my job is to control the, pound, the pounds on the ground. Yeah, they didn't see the value. And because it cuts into their business, it's it's not which is ridiculous. Yeah, because I mean, even though the, the the natural products were cost more, right? Too. But not a not a whole lot of people were going to make it or making it. I mean, IC3 just went off the market, by the way. Um, yeah, you know that was that was one. You know that was a thing. So when I was talking to them, I know a secret. I only use IC3 for the smell. Yeah, the peppermint smell. Well, I I, I actually do use it intentionally for my ornamentals. Yeah, because I, I I made my own blend oh. after after like seven years of testing in the gardens, I discovered I control I can control plant diseases. Yeah, yeah, I was a big uh, uh, WPX. <laughs> you got her. There she goes. Yeah, um, yeah, like I, I was a big like eco PCO WPX guy. Yeah, I, I used Level a lot power. of that for it. GHP. Yeah, and then but what I realized it says hey, if I just go to facilities IPM. Like I started, I bought the first System 3 crack and crevice. I went from baseboard spraying to just crack and crevice kitchen. And then I figured out, I don't even have to do that. Oh, there's a bee on my on my box. Oh, yeah. It's a honeybee. Yeah, European honeybee. Yeah. He's like, it's fall, this is what we call false free. Where like it warms up, things start to emerge. Okay. And then it'll get cold again and it'll emerge. So you'll get like some false spring. What will happen is a lot of customers will start calling right now because they're Ants are moving, stinging insects are moving. Okay, so temperature drops and then it goes back they, up. They will, yeah, and then when it, when it, when soil temperature warms up, uh -huh. it's like all of a sudden everything emerges. Got it. So like fall springs is always good. Yeah, so, so I, we don't experience that in Florida. So no, <laughs> not, not in not Miami. Florida. No. Here, yeah. So fall springs are always good. So I, my last company that I interned with, I got fired because it's like you just take too long out at customers' homes because I was practicing IPM. Right. Now, here's the kicker. I was still bringing in the same amount of money, and I had way less way less oh. service calls compared to everybody else. Well, I always have a fit about that. Yeah. With companies but like, I, you know, that your, your service calls, and you got happy clients, you're using less chem, and you're still, I mean, my guys are still producing back to back the same thing anybody else would produce. I got guys in companies claiming they're spending 45 minutes an hour. I'm saying, how the heck? It's like, my guys are spending, you know, 20 minutes on average, but we're yeah. not treating anything inside that doesn't need to be treated. No, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I got fired for spending too much time. The quality of the service went up. The service calls dropped drastically, where it was like, you get two to three a day. I might've got two a week. Yeah, my guy last week got, he got two calls. On average, he gets two to three calls a week. Yeah. And it was like, and it was all purely by observation. Right. Like, for instance. Observational like, biology. Yeah. Like, yeah. for instance, I dropped my van out. Like, I was trained for roaches. Right. Right. And I'm like, walking around, and I'm seeing these little white dots, like, move. I'm like, what? And I, like, look at it. I'm like, holy shit. The ants are, like, picking it up. Which was really cool. Right. right. I know it works <laughs> great. I've heard it works great for OHA. I can't, I can't get... Yeah, well, over there. So, so for them to pick it up. Yeah. So what I did is I start, I, I I watched and I go, they're going to take this back to the damn nest. They're right. going to take it back to the nest. Right. Or wherever the dot is moving, they're going towards the nest. Right. So then I was like, All right, I'm going to come back. I'm going to look at it. And then I followed it and I pulled back, like the mulch or whatever that was around the structure of the house, or it was like five feet away. Found a massive ant nest, like right. area that I wasn't going to treat if I right. treated this structure of the house, right? Because where it was, right? Right. Was, You're treating what one to three feet from the house? Yeah. Okay. I would have never ever treated that, right? right? Right. And so when I did, I was like, oh my god! And I ran to the truck and I grabbed the D and G or whatever, and then I sprayed it. Right. Okay. I was the first person to get rid of her damn ants in like two years. Right. The first person. Right. And I go, okay, so nibans a pesticide, but it's also a tool. Right. Right. 
And so then I started using that nine band more and more on the exterior as a tool. Like if someone has an ant issue, because I'll be able to figure out where the ant problems are. Right. And it was the same thing with dust. It was yeah. like dust is a pesticide, but I started utilizing it as a tool and just started like in, interjecting in random places and then an explosion of ants would come out. Right. Flushing tool. Yes. 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 Well, I never yeah. knew yeah. about freaking flushing. Right, right. Right. So a lot of this stuff, like the nine band and the dusting and stuff like that, that was all just by purely observing, right? That was going outside the element of like, I'm dropping the granule, I'm dropping the knife, I'm sweeping down the webs, I'm spraying, they'll have a ticket and going. Believe it or not, we're an IPM company that does natural. So we're we're a holistic company. We look at yep. it as a holistic process. Holistic's a great keyword. And and then right. And then but I the biggest challenge I have even with my guys who buy my work for me it's hard to teach. No, and even even getting them to stop and slow down and do it. I, at times I said, you know, guys, whenever I like I only stop. I got a rule in my company. Turn it I, on. I I only get Wrong involved. <laughs> I'll dive out next time, save you a trip. Oh, cool. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I, wearing pajamas here. I only have one. Yeah. I only have, uh, I only get involved in like less than 1% of the cases now where I actually have to go out and intervene. I told my guys, if you get three shots, if by three shots you haven't been able to do it, you miss something. Yeah. If you just take the time to look, if, if you did it the first time, and by the second time it still hasn't worked, you miss something. You need to go back and spend some time looking and, and digging and doing this and that and the other, and then you'll find it. So now the time that it takes for me to like I only this month I only I've only had to go out once last month. Once. It's hard. It's I, I, it's hard to teach people. It's hard to, to teach them to be you. And because yeah. that's what we experience as well. It's hard yeah. to teach them to be me. Yeah. You know, and it was hard for me to get out of the field because people are like, oh, I want Pete, he's good. I got out of that quick. Yeah, I I got out of that quick. I think, you know, what my advantage was, was all, you know, we hear the excuses of like ADHD and it's this mental disability. I got ADHD. I I think it's, I think it's this freaking superpower, right? It is. You know how many times like if I'm like looking for a screwdriver and then I find something and I'm like, oh, what's, and then I start tinkling with that and I go, I need a tool. So it was the same exact thing, right? (laughs) My, My girlfriend says, you're like you're like you're like you're like the what was that that that, that with the little dog and the old man, and the dog would just go squirrel. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, yeah yeah. Up, up. Okay, that that's she says I'm the dog, right? Squirrel. <laughs> it's, it's it's a gift, right? Because yeah. if it wasn't for my ADHD, I would have never it would have never piqued my curiosity. Going, hey, yeah, wow, something picked up the bait. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah. I'm like well, I'm gonna follow it. And that's what we did. We're off on a rabbit trail following this damn man. <laughs> And we're like 45 minutes later, we're still trailing this ant. But yeah, that, I, I think what makes, I, I'm not like, like my girlfriend, like I, I, she, if she, I know if she takes an IQ test, like she's, she's going to come up like really genius. And if I take one, it comes out as moron, you know, I'm not really that smart. Until you get a stimulant in you and you become really smart. Yeah, but I'm not smart, but my ability to just, I get it. Well, like I, textbook I, smart? I can be textbook smart. But you know what my biggest problem is? Why I haven't taken the ACE? I have to study so hard because I'm a terrible test taker. That, well, that's the problem, though. You've got to understand, like, the education system isn't built, this structure of an education system isn't built for a small percentage of people. No, people it isn't. with ADHD, right? It isn't. That's why people with ADHD struggle in school because they don't know how to teach. second, third grade. Don't know yeah, how to grade. engage. But, you know, people else. would get pissed off at that. But I say, if every pet roofing company, you know how many calls I get after a roofer's been out there? For oh. American roaches and rats and mice. Yeah, I mean it's incredible. I said the first question I asked people was like, "When was the last time you did a roofing job?" He says, "Oh, it was just like six months ago. We started having this problem after we did the roof. They're terrible." Well, yeah, yeah, and even like um, before here in Georgia, like they didn't have to replace the drip edge. Right now they have to replace the drip edge. Right, and you're like, "Oh shit, sh- that's going to take a lot of like rodents and stuff." Yeah. We partnered up with roofing companies and said, you know, you pay us, it's a $350 inspection fee. We'll go out and make sure everything's tidied up or whatever. Right. And then we would uh, upsell like the gable vents and stuff like that. But we right. would go out and do the uh, paid inspection that the roofing company paid for. To check their, to check their work to make right. sure that there was no ro- rodents coming in. Right. So there's there's a lot. Of, I can't give them all because. I know, I know, I know. It's a. You, you, we're gonna go out of business. We don't. If you want, want my secrets? Got to be a client. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, by the way, he does SEO, so um, that's what that, Yeah, that, that's why I don't want to do SEO. 
Um, I really don't. I mean, people are like, you're going to do SEO. I know he's going to do SEO. He talks so much. I don't want to, I want to become an in-house agency. Everything I learn is an SEO is for me. I don't really teach it. I don't have the time to create a course. There's so much out there already. That's kind of people ahead. doing it. I don't want to do SEO. That's a smooth hair Jack Russell Terrier. Oh yeah. It's a rat dog. Yeah, they're awesome. I've got a couple of clients and they were, and they got a couple of different Jack Russell Terriers, but yeah, that's smooth here, but that's what we have. And JoJo was a game changer in the rodent industry. In the mole industry, JoJo was a game changer. Like JoJo, like we have, so we have a bed bug dog. We have a rat sniffing dog. They're both personal pets now because I've sold okay. everything and I want to keep my dogs. Right. We didn't do bed bug work. Callie was just for show. You know, like a house shows and stuff, get to pet the dog or whatever. Bed bugs gave me a heebie jeebies. Can't, didn't even do German roaches either. But JoJo? Like we bought him and he was awesome in rodent work, but it's really hard because you're in urban area. So how do you get like the rodent dog to do things? And he helped out when we really needed him. Like he found an entryway that was like 30 feet away. From what, do you, what do you have mostly here in Georgia? Roof rat or? Roof, or, Norway's or and, and mouse. You got Norway's Oh, too? we got all three. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See in Miami, we, 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 I found some Norway's on the West coast, like Naples. Yeah. But uh, I don't, I've never seen a Norway. In Miami, it's always roof rat because they're so much more aggressive and they'll displace them. But I guess yeah. you have a lot. Yeah, yeah. Like this would all we're, be. Like we're all urban, urban, so we're urban too. But we would because we have we sit on crawl spaces and uh, we have the roof rats and we have the Norway rats that come underneath. Especially like in inner city, like the Norway rats are crazy. Like the burrows and everything, right? All over the place, right? So that was the goal was to get into like commercial, like because you know like all these big manufacturing facilities because. Um, the reason why we, we got this massive account, it was a cabinet maker okay. account, and they called us because um, they had this customized countertop that was made, but it had seeds in it. And these rats were eating the seeds in the countertop that they were manufacturing. And where the where the seeds were coming? Because this was a natural wood product. Yeah, it was. I don't. It was. It was a specialized countertop that somebody wanted. Right. And it, I just remember it being gray. And having like random seeds in it, but they were chewing the damn seeds, and yeah, they were like chewing right through it, yeah. the countertop. And I was like, I don't know how once, this works. Once you once you install it, you just thought, well, that's just a natural aesthetic of the of the board. It, yeah, it was. It, it, was, it was crazy because because these cause, girls, they're natural. Well, you got to imagine the phone call because then the sales rep goes, "Hey, dude, uh, like there's rats chewing on someone's countertop." Like, I was like, "What? What are you What are you talking about?" So I go to this manufacturer place they do cabinets and countertops it's huge it's like three massive warehouses all in you know they're right. all in the same city but you got to drive to each location because there's and they're all in the same property but it's so far right and then right. to check bait boxes you got to drive the truck because you'll close your exercise ring and just by doing that job yeah those are big and so but like these guys were like building this system where they, you know, the rats would climb up and the rats would fall into this barrel. So like when I went, there was like 30 rats in one warehouse, like just in one warehouse bay, right? Oh, wow. There's like, there's like, and there's like 60 bay. Oh, wow. Right? So, cause each one does something in the pen. I was like, oh, that was really intuitive. That's pretty awesome. Right. And he's like, what are you gonna do with the rats? Cause they're all alive. I'm like, um, let's throw some bay in there and then leave them and I'll grab them when they're dead. <laughs> yeah, I know. What like, but it is, so I was like, when I was doing that, I was like, I need to invest in a dog, right? right. He did phenomenal there. And we knocked out a lot. And then uh, <laughs> we couldn't get rid of it. And they hired us because they couldn't get rid of it. Right. You know, and then we got, you, I mean, you could, just the name of the company. Yeah. It's a big one. And I don't want to go toe to toe in court. And, but they hired them back. And I was like, well, that sucks. But it was. It was okay. It was like a 45 hour minute, hour, 45 or an hour drive out there anyways. Yeah. And it took all day. Yeah. I had the same thing with a, with a big Mercedes dealer. Yeah. They, I got hired because they kept getting into these Mercedes and chewing up all the wires. Oh, good. I thought you were going to say they were taking a catalytic converters. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that, that happens. Those are hood rats. Our, yeah. Hood rats. <laughs> yeah. That's a different rat. Um, yeah. We can't shoot them or anything. <laughs> no. no, but, but they, these rats were eating all of the vehicles and then they were getting inside the base because it's like because that wiring is coated right with organic materials i don't know what it was but dude they were like the last mercedes was five grand worth of shop repairs in the wiring and they, and they did a bunch of them 
So, and then the doors, they had these automatic doors that you would just drive up and the doors would open up in the bays and then they would immediately close. Yeah. And what happened was all the, the sides of them, the metal work, there was no metal work. I think I smoked that cigar a little bit too quick. I think so, bro. Yeah. You know, I told you to take it easy. When it's in my hand. Yeah, I know. I told you to take it easy. You know, I'm still like, yeah, I'm enjoying this, man. This is like a four hour. It was cigar. in my hand. Huh? You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. What do I do with my hand? It's the ADD thing, bro. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So I got hired by this company, and we knocked out all the rodents. We did all the exclusion on all the bays doors, metal work, because they they have these left holes, these holes for the alarm wire to go through, and they it's were huge. Those guys is that poop or a rock? That is like agate, I think. Okay, I think so. I'll so yeah, so and then after they they, they the, the that guy left, and they brought in this management company to do the cleaning. And all that. Oh, we're gonna use our people. I'm like crap. Yeah, I mean yeah. that was a big account for us. Yeah, yeah. But with that, we got JoJo, the the, the rat sniffer, right? And um, and I was like, we had an issue with the mole job. And what's crazy is like, it's it's wild to think like a lot of rodent wildlife companies don't do mole work because it's a challenge. Ooh, hot. Yeah, I bet. There you go. Um, Way too high. So it was. It's crazy. Like. Um, Cause even like some of my clients here in Georgia, I'm like, gotta do mold, man. They're like, no, no, it's, and it is hit or miss, right? Right. But Jojo, game changer with the mold. Game changer with the mold. When people get like their yards all like treated and stuff like that, the last thing they want is to see runs. Right. All over, and it goes crazy. And then of course, when they start seeing runs, um, when they start seeing the runs, the uh, HOA gets involved and like, hey, you know, you're gonna fix your, your lawn, here's yeah. your letter, you're gonna get fined next year. Oh, or so there's a lot of big HOAs down here. Oh yeah, like every, I mean, the majority of all neighborhoods are HOAs, so you capitalize really? on that. Really, all right, cool. Um, yeah. And even on older neighborhoods too, man, people spend a lot of money on their grass. Okay. And so the last thing one is like moles destroying it, but it was crazy how many rodent wildlife companies didn't do it. When I brought Jojo out and Jojo was like, he, was like sniffing around and he was like in the mulch and he was like, Pow. and then he started digging in the guy's mulch and he pulled out a mole and I was like, and he pulled out a second mole and I go, oh my God, I'm gonna use them on the moles. And we were, I started like, and then. So this is serendipity. Yeah, yeah, again, right? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's op looking at four opportunities, right? right Being right. observant, it's the same thing with the night band, right? It's right, like, right. what's going on? Right. I see this with Jojo and I'm going, this is something, this is something really big. Right. And so again, on marketing, even on SEO, no one's doing it. So you start dropping in mold content, all of a sudden you start, and then we're yeah. getting like seven, 10 leads a week just on molds. And JoJo stayed busy with that. And, and sometimes it was one and done. And sometimes it took two to three dimes uh, visits out there. But it was $4 minimum, $400 minimum, the first visit, and $150 each visit after that. Right. It was wild. It was wild. Like I got so much booze in my cabinet from a client, um, um, because it was uh, the moles destroyed him and his neighbor's yard, right. and he was like a rep for like a liquor company. Right. And he was like, he was like, hey man, um, do you want cash or do you want me to pay you guys like in liquor? I was like, liquor. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it was the good stuff. Oh, it was a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I know, right? It was a lot of good stuff, and uh, and from there, like. The amount of money that Jojo brought in just off of moles, and I was his handler, so right. I was going out to all the mole work myself, was like phenomenal, right? But it was taking those, find, looking at those opportunities, just like Nidan, and pulling the trigger and going like, there's an opportunity here. Right. Right? A lot of people, again, they're technicians, they think technicians, they think spray. Sweep down webs. Yeah, I did. I did what I was supposed to do in the protocol, and that's it. That's it. Yeah. And they missed. And they missed the massive boat. Or a lot of people are like, "I'm going to go toe to toe with road and wildlife companies." When they can go toe to toe with other companies that right. aren't even in the wildlife business, right? Or pest control business, and you can still sell on them because you can provide more value than another company. But um, you know, so when we grew, it pest control was just. Uh, our foot in the door right at, at the end of the day like you know i was like i had a vision it was like i'm going to grow a natural pest control company right but in reality it was just a foot in the door for other things when you start looking for the, seeing other opportunities 
like insulation and rodent wildlife and mall work and stuff like that. Right. And that's what changed the dynamic. And like, again, like listening to one of my, the guy who I brought on as a business partner who had turf experience, like he was with me for six, seven, eight months or something like that. And he was like questioning like, you know, pest control is nothing like turf and it's not. It's not, it's totally different. But the marketing on turf is phenomenal. Yeah. Right, and that's another, and so turf was another way to get our foot in the door to sell pest control. So right. when we start like turning over and making people's lawns look great, yeah. like people who are with big companies or with competitors and stuff, we go, hey, bundle your services. And all of a sudden the growth of our pest control increased again right. after we felt like we hit that market cap. Right. Now we couldn't push natural because not everybody's into natural. Right. So we did pest control, traditional, but it wasn't. It was still all natural. Yeah. So sometimes when customers go, hey, so we're going to cancel because we want to look for a natural alternative. We go, well, you're in luck. For the last two years, we've done nothing but natural. Yeah. What? What, what, what I did, you know, was, mine was completely different um, because since I was in ornamentals and lawn, I was trying to find a way to do organic lawn care. Yeah. And what I found was that it was the, the, the aha moment for me was I could never sell GHP, general household pest. Market. The no, the oh. reason was a, a company customers would tell me, hey, look, if we also do, if you got end problems, anything. No, you don't understand, Frank. Ever since you started doing our service, we don't have an end problem anymore. Yeah. So we started doing the lawn and we didn't do perimeter windows. We just did around the house because the lawn was there. Yeah. And we never saw another ant problem. And it was like, how the hell am I going to sell GHP? Night, we're 95%. Oh, so you're, you, you were on the turf end. Right. And then you were doing what a lot of turf companies were doing. We could treat, we could do your pest control, but just perimeter. Can't touch the structure. Can't do the interior. No, we had both licenses. Oh, you did. Okay. But I couldn't sell it to save my life. Uh, and I, until until I got into natural. Then when I I was doing the natural for lawn all the time, the whole time I was doing lawn care. I was doing. We were 100% natural on all shrubs. We were like 70%, 80% less pesticide on the lawn because we started doing IPM. We started controlling the irrigation. We figured if we control the irrigation. We don't have disease outbreaks. Yeah. If, if we, and then we started going into biological fertilizers. And I said, if we go into biological fertilizer, what we found is we were, we were, we were inoculating the soil. So we, people are like, bro, you don't buy inoculating. Any That's yeah. The word. Yeah. They're inoculating. I don't even know what it is. Yeah. So what, I'm what tr uh, but I'm, I trust what you're saying. But what we were doing is fixing the soil biology and the, and the good bacteria in the soil, just like in your gut. Yes started okay, rising gotcha, yep and then and then the diseases were no longer like almost non-present yeah you encourage deeper root growth as well so they could pull up more micronutrients right yes. so, so what i did was yes, I, I went to, that's exactly what you're I, I got to. into organic farming to understand what i was doing in it because the, or, the ornamental industry wasn't teaching anything about no they were selling stimulants yeah quick release stuff yeah which encouraged shallow root growth right yeah so i started focusing on hey if i cut the water back i get the deeper roots if i do the soil biology the the root strengthens plus the soil bacteria rises yep and we have less so my my supplier would say dude you don't buy any fungicides from us who do you buy them from he says i don't use fungicides i don't need it yeah. he says that can't be you have to do it on every application i says no we we stop doing it and we only do it in the winter when I get an outbreak on a property, other than that, I don't apply it. You, you know where 90% of this is a statistic that I'm just making up, but from my experience, a lot of all the diseases and everything like that is a couple of things. One, people overwatering, and two, people watering at night. Watering at night and then over nitrogen. Yeah. Because a lot of diseases are susceptible to nitrogen. So what, what my, my, I was trained Which you just replaced with potassium. Exactly. And your grass greens up. And we got, that's what we did. We yeah. just, and a lot of times we just use the liquid application. So then we figured out we could be very efficient with liquid, creating a bio stimulant, a bio fertilizer yeah. that I made in house. And I started using the natural on the shrubs. And, and then I, w I met with a manufacturer's rep. Uh, and he says, you know, I said, ever since I started mixing your product and using them like this, I noticed over the year that I don't have any disease on my shrubs. And it's funny you should say that. We've been doing the same research, and we came up with a product now that's going to be introduced that is going to do that. But I started doing like hundred studies. Like I'm a like I'm a bookworm like that way. Yeah. So I was doing like a hundred studies 
on all different types of diseases and, and different paths. So on shrubs, nobody can touch me on organic. But everybody's still spraying with bifenthrin. We're like, we're getting better results with, with the, our natural blend that we make and our biological fertilizer. And then I started testing other people's and it wasn't as good for like two years. And now we, we were testing other ones that, oh, this is just as good. No, we had to go, we're going back now to making our own because our own blend, because it isn't as good. So that's how I found out. So then I got into GHP and when I started, I had perfected this program and the customers were like, do you offer organic? We had been offering it the whole time, yeah. but we couldn't say anything because we weren't that company. Yeah. Then in 2013 is when I rebranded and I said, okay, we're going to be Nature Fest and we're going to do it. And then I had already done, you know, IPM for facilities. Yeah. So all I did is we bring the same level of, I treated every home. My aha moment was I asked myself one day, just stupid me, just saying, if I had to treat a hospital surgical room, would I be allowed to use a and g I didn't know anything about facilities. Yeah. So That's I started yeah. So I started looking at it and says, how do you do it? So I started looking at San Francisco and I started looking at like facilities IPM. And, and they don't even use natural products in facilities because you can't use it. And, and I said, how is it? Still they, right? It's still a pesticide, right? It's still a pesticide plus the odor inside, ah, yeah. the, the allergies and all that, it triggers. So I said, no, 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 how would you do it? And and then that's the year that I cut out even cracking crevice. I bought the whole system three line when it first came out. And then I, and we even stopped. We don't do cracking crevice anymore. We don't do nope. any baseboard spraying. No. We don't do any surface spraying. You don't have to. We don't do anything. We were the first people, like, even my supplier to this day says, hey, bro, what spray are you using in there? I says, no, you don't understand, bro. We use nothing. We're a bait company primarily. That, well, that, and that's the thing, right? It's like, that's what they're taught because it's a production. It's a show. Yeah. Right? Go ahead and do it. That's a, a common roach isn't going to just be hanging out on freaking baseball. Even the we, customers. We, we know that, right? Yeah, the customers, right? They, they're in the show. Yeah. So, like, when we're, they, they expect a show. Um, so, you give them a show. But I'll tell you this. I don't know how many times we've had it where a customer is like, wow, you've spent way more time out here than oh, yeah. the previous company. Oh, we're so it's 45 like it's minutes to an hour. It's not necessarily the, you know, partaking in that whole entire baseboard show. Yeah. Right? Because they go, because they've already re recognized that the fact that you spend way more time out there. Yeah. Two, you must be know what you're doing because they don't have ants anymore. Yeah. Right? So now you're already, your values elevate it without even spraying baseboards. Yeah. No, it, it, even the customer, because we, we started figuring it out. And I said, this is my value add proposition. So my value add proposition, yeah. we're, so, we're the only, because I can't prove it. that yeah. we're, But I know in South Florida, we're the only company that has a, an exclusive zero indoor spray soap. We're, 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 we zero, like my guys aren't allowed to spray. They won't. You ask them, they're like, yeah, like, literally, like, they'll look at you like, uh-uh, we're not allowed. Nothing. And like, I, I even had one, one tech like, Hey man, this guy's insistent. I said, you tell the client, if they insist on a baseboard spray, I can give them the list of 281 companies that will do that for us. Yeah. But they hired us to control the problem. They didn't hire us to spray their baseboard. Exactly. So when people call me, even the client will say, well, since you don't spray the baseboard, how are you going to control my ant problem? And how are you going to control my roach problem? And I says, well, here's, and I give them a whole study on this. This is our sales pitch. And it's our standardized script and I teach the client, but even the client will say it, that's impossible. You can't control pests without spraying. And, and we focus on the outdoor. Um, like we started noticing with our program, we, we don't have in 15 years that I've been doing this, a single client that has told me they even have termites and we got big termite problems with life, but it's it, the way it works is like, no, we couldn't, we don't have, like only new, the only thing we get termite calls for is new clients. I just bought a home and we discovered it has termites. None of the structures I've been working on for 15 years, the client ever said to me, hey, we got termites. Yeah, we only ever, had, we had one where termites that showed up at someone's house. Yeah. And it was right in the dead center, mono slab, dead center of the house. You, you're not going to. And that's something, but we don't have like South Florida where we're at. We just started getting a big problem with promotion. Yeah, that's becoming more and more of an issue here too. Yeah, so it's moving, moving west and south, but subterranean really isn't that big in South Florida for us. 
Yes. Like, that's, still, that's still good, man. Oh, uh, it's going to be hot. No, no, no. Because no. you puff it too much, dude. I know, I know. You it's, puff it's it a, too much. I gotta, it's I gotta there bring, and it's I got to like bring this down because I almost torched my finger. I'm like... But, yeah, yeah e- even like what here in Georgia, like I know for a fact that like Town Lake Parkway, there's a neighborhood, I can't remember what neighborhood, she had ants. And it was all in her house, like coming out. Like I mean, there was like six or different, six or seven different lines. Right. And with that Nidan, right, you know, it opened up the doors, right. So then you get like the uh, Uncle Albert's gourmet bait. Yeah, that's what we used. And so I used it for years, but I found that for me, thick would work better for our ant species because it it, it really has to do with the end of what the sugar they prefer. Yeah, this is more as a tool again, right? Yeah. So this isn't about to control ants. This is yeah, about yeah. like, okay, if we have a massive ant trail inside right. the kitchen, I'm going to dab one on one side of the kitchen. I'm going to yeah. dab it on the other side. Whatever which one's heavier and the trail that stops, yeah. I know exactly where these ants right. are coming from, right? So when I, when nothing showed up on the right side of the kitchen and everything, and all the ants stopped at the left side, I go, I know where I need to focus on. Right. So on this side of the house. Stop. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the glue boards. There he is again. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, um, thanks, man. You want one? I'm good, thank you. All right. I would, but he's gonna be yeah. gassed out. You can't yeah, puff know. anything right now. Um. So even with like glue boards, right? Like if we have like a, like especially going into the city with American roaches, mm-hmm. like. We could do the night band. We could do the sprays and stuff. But the blue boards is what's really going to tell us Mandatory. that story. Every time right? So if we it. drop it and then we come back out, because, you know, we, we do the initial and then we do like a courtesy follow-up. A free courtesy, but it's included in the initial. Yeah, the same thing we do. And we go, we see everything on that left side of the house and nothing on the right side. I know my guys know where they need to focus now. Yeah, and that tells us a whole lot about what's happening in the house because there has to be water. Because you can't have a roaches in a room. Like I tell a client, oh, I only see them in my bedroom. I said, you got a hole in this room somewhere. Because I said, there's no way you're going to have American roaches in a bedroom. Yeah. You, unless you have a hole. He says, no, oh, there's no you, hole. You start pulling out the outlets. You start seeing droppings behind the outlets. Yeah. No, start... what, what I find is, when I find them in the room, it's like I tell them immediately, you got a hole somewhere in this room. He says, oh, no. I said, I bet you there's a hole in that closet. He says, oh, no, no, no. We've been living here 14 years. Old. I said, pull that stuff out. We pull it out. There's this hole. Somebody dinged the, the drywall and made a giant hole and with there, something. And, and, and the interior walls, and there's no insulation there. Nope, not on the interior so, walls. And then yeah. they're following air movement. Yeah, so that's you know, into so, the house. So that tells me two things. We still got an entry point that we haven't dealt yeah. with. And we so we do an added treatment at that point. And then if it keeps happening, then the next step we do is, dude, you got to do. You got to call a plumber and do a smoke test. Somewhere you got a broken line. We got guys. No, 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 no. I've been living in this. No. Sure enough, we found the broken line. I'm telling you what, like smoke, like we we incorporate smoke tests, especially with the insulation and stuff. Right. But the smoke test is a really great tool. Um, even like, how many, like if someone, so here, here's a scenario, right? This is a scenario we have. You go into a house, they're only seeing American roaches on one side of the house, right? right? Or in just a one room. You go, what are the variables of like why it's just in that one room? There has to be a water source somewhere. There has to be an entry point. Can't have it without an entry point. And usually, like for us, it's like, okay, do we have pocket doors? Po- pocket doors are huge. Pocket doors. So yeah. And then and then the bathroom, the bathroom pipes, there there's there's a three inch hole for a two inch, you know, a two yeah. inch pipe. So, you know, again, let's find out. Let's see. So my guy will take a little bit excluder because we don't want to use the foam. The people like no. yellow foam. I think it's closed. That's, that's it, nasty. Well, we could do we do bathrooms that the cabinet alone is like three grand, you know. So if we get, you know, we're not cleaning that up. I just take sticky boards and I just go, boom, boom, like, don't do that, <laughs> <laughs> bro. You're gonna kill me. My client would lose their. No, I've seen people do so, it. You know what I do is, you know, I, in the modern cabinets, you know that they, they have drawers, right? Yeah. And then they don't have anything underneath. We can't stick them on or anywhere because they have little kids. So we just we pull out the drawer, and then what I learned to bait all my bait boards with is I actually, rather than using Nyban is I actually just ground up dog food. I grind up dog food and I will find mice, I will find things that are in that house that aren't because of the carbs, proteins. You got everything anybody wants. You yeah. got oils, you got carbohydrates, you got proteins, you got sugars, 
And so what I do is I bait all my boards and I stick it underneath one of those drawers and I close it. And I tell my guy, I put a blue board underneath that cabinet when he comes back and looks for it. And sure enough, that's the source. It's in that area. Or, you know, we'll find it. But yeah, you, you know, holes in the wall. There's There has to be a leak in the roof yeah. somewhere. There, there, there's a leak running that because we have block construction. Yeah. So it's us really, we, we can actually have a leak through the block. And never know. And never know. And it's leaking back out and not in. So that's how all of these things that were just, you know, it's about really, I, I mean, I, I, who, who coined that term? It was Bobby Coring who coined the term observational biology. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like I had one where it was like an American roach issue just in that one room and a big entertainment stand and I could see behind the entertainment stand that they had like two windows. Right. So it's very common here. You leave your window, like okay. especially your second story, you don't leave a lock. That top sash will drop. Right. And it'll leave like a gap. All right. And we were able to get back there and finagle and zip it and wall eliminate a, it. Wall ACs. Yeah, well, we just lifted the and locked the window. Yeah. eliminated the roach problem in that room. Yeah, simple and, as that. And, and, and like I tell, I, I, but how many people would go to like baseboard spray and stuff without even doing a proper inspection? No, my guys now. I mean, I even make them on an, every initial service. You have to have a. I mean, they they report 10, 12 pictures of things that are exclusion problems. Yeah, that, that you know the client doesn't fix. You know, so we tell them and we, you know, now we're getting into exclusion work. We never did, but it's so hard to find crafts people that. You need a craftsman for sure. Yeah. So, so it's tough. So I don't want a pest control guy stopping his route for two hours. So we need, we need a specialized guy. No, now. like, cause even like that wildlife and exclusion industry, look at this. We can ride. I, I found that to be those petty bars to be the most annoying thing. Like there's no way I'm having a drink and pedaling. I, like having barbecue like we just did and then having a beer and then pedaling a cab, we would just, I would just barf all over the place. Well, they're pedal, they don't have to pedal, but it's a business. Yeah, it is. They're, they're and all you've got over a Miami. GoPro attached to it too, so he's yeah. taking live footage of it. Yeah. But that's new. I've never seen that here. But yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, that observation and like, and that's the biggest thing is like, how do you train somebody to observe things? Like, I just don't think a normal technician would figure out the top sash is down. Mm -hmm. Or a normal technician would go, hey, I bet you there's, there's got to be a hole in this See, my, 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 my advantage to all this, again, bringing back your everything you bring to the table, I spent half or more of my life in home improvement. Yeah. I was involved in home improvement since I was a kid. But I actually sold siding. I sold decks. I sold windows. I, you know, I, I know construction. And so I can walk up to a house and by the time I'm already driving up to the driveway and I'm already observing where there's problems. And my guy, I'll go around the property where he took pictures of everything. Goes, Did you see this? Oh no, man, I missed that. Oh, okay. That's so again, yeah, it's, but it's that 1% game. Like, do I need to be involved in everything? And like, I, like right now I was doing the exclusion. I have one of my, my lawn tech is actually really good with doing some exclusion work. Yeah. So what I've done since things were a little slow with him, I started selling exclusion and having him do it. Um, but again, like like I got clients right now today, do you know a good handyman? Can't find one to save your life. No, you can't find one here either. Yeah. So so and then if they are, you know, I tell clients, look, our our labor rate minimum is 159 an hour. The average oh no, but I had this, you know, um, handyman and he's like 60 an hour here. We need to find him. But the problem is the handyman doesn't understand insect biology, doesn't understand yeah. rodent biology, doesn't understand animal behavior. So he'll put this mesh and he'll put it wrong and the guy will just eat around it. Well, even before that, the handyman doesn't understand value. He thinks value is a number that you discount and go yeah. like, I am giving you value at 60 bucks an hour. I just had one this morning. The, the guy says, oh, I need to, I need to do uh, in, back in my city, yeah. in my town. And he says, oh, you know, I'm a hand, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a contractor and a handyman. And we guarantee you the lowest price and we'll match everybody's Yeah, value. because that's where their value is. That was right? it. Your value is in something different. Right. And that's, and that's what. The experience the customer right, has. The experience. And that's where the value is at, yeah. right? You pay for value. You know, if you're going to drive a Mercedes Benz, you pay for that. You pay for that luxury. You pay for that value. If you want to drive a Kia, you pay for that. Damn. Hey, man, I own a Kia. What's wrong? Mike, we own a Kia, too. 
Yeah, I'm great... actually I'm getting I'm actually getting ready to upgrade mine. I actually I'm thinking well, about I... it getting me my the Audi uh, Q3. I, I ordered a so after the auto accidents. So because I let's see the I had got into an auto accident. Then I got went from there. Oh, then I got like the truck, like the uh, big Ford truck, and then it got totaled. I got hit, and um, and I was like, I'm not gonna. I, I'm not. I, I don't want you know because buying a car is a pain in the ass, and so. Um, the only car that I can buy online and it get delivered was a Kia Soul. I was like, that's it. That's all I'm doing. I, I, I yeah. didn't want to deal with the nonsense of going over to like a freaking dealership. Oh my God. It's like six hours to buy a vehicle. It's insane. It's insane. I was like, I'm not going to do that again. And so I bought a Kia Soul and it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I originally so, wanted to buy one. I bought, this is the third, this is my second, my second Kia that I've owned. Oh, yeah. I, I had another Sorento and then I got another Sorento this time. <laughs> And I'm thinking of buying the Telluride. So we, we st when we started like changing things, um, we moved everybody out of truck. The pest control guys out of trucks and moved them into Kia Souls. I, I had a, a Nissan Versa. I did a test to do it. The problem that you have with a lot of it is the amount of product that you can legally carry, and then the the, the product getting into the smells, getting into the vehicle. That was the only thing. So yeah, yeah I went back to truck, and then now I just bought a big old van. Because the biggest challenge we have with like people, why would you get a van? You know, why don't you get a truck? And then why don't you get like a, a lawn truck? And like the problem, biggest problem we have is HOA. Everybody lives either in an HOA or an apartment, even the techs. Yeah. So they don't allow it. So like, I can't do a full wrap. Like I can only do the sign on the side, and then I gotta put a white thing on it. So in my house, I've got three vehicles parked. Right? Really? Yeah. You're everyone's favorite in that neighborhood, aren't you? But everything is like. There's no signs on it. Yeah. So so you can't tell. So we had to do that. A lot of the things. So I'm building this van, you know, that's a big Ram van, but it's got, it's going to have four tanks and four and three reels and four backpacks. And then it's like a yeah. full thing. But man, we can go, we can do termite, we can do lawn, we can do GHP, and then we can park it anywhere. Yeah. We carried very little because they would stock up every morning. So we carried very little product in our vehicle. But what, when we got the Kias, they offered a free gym, so so they had a gym in their, in their dealership. Yeah. So the technicians could go there. I, they, That's uh, interesting. Yeah, the tires, the um, all the maintenance, the oil changes, and stuff like that. Like we just paid this fee, and so the techs would go there, and they had little touchdown stations where you can work, right. you can send out your quotes or whatever. It was a, it was a good move for us because before we were like nice. managing all the oil change I, I think it's about taking advantage of everybody's situation is different like guys like I, I, I like how much is up if I wanted to rent a 1500 square foot to 2500 square warehouse in this area to store the vehicles the fertilizers and everything what would it run um so I think ours was about four thousand and we spent right around 9k a month yeah see it's pricey and it was too. like it was uh and we had um Four bays, and that's where all the lawn vehicles parked yeah. in. Right now, in, in a fourteen hundred square foot in Broward County would run you a million five to buy it. That's yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I don't. <laughs> you can't rent it for like you couldn't rent it for less than six thousand a month. It doesn't matter how much money you had. You can't do it. So the, they're not available either. The facility, yeah, the facility that we got, um, we bought the land and built it, and it was like I think it ended up costing us about four hundred thousand dollars more. Because we didn't get a uh, geo test, like for rocks and stuff. Standing, it was like you had to blast rocks, level out, yeah. and it just cost us a shit ton of money. Like it was a big pain in the ass. It was like 400k that we really didn't think that we were gonna. Right. Uh, that we Which weren't gonna have to into use. marketing. Yeah, <laughs> but then like the the then um, instead of buying what we did is we had little touchdown stations uh -huh. all over the place so we had one off bell's ferry right um your friend probably shops at that public shop center but it's a real estate building so there's mortgage brokers roofers real right. estate agents and your pest control guy and guess what they have weekly meetings so all the wdo letters came through us there's a facility what's not community that's where we did the wipeout right over there okay so it was like 400 bucks it was an office it was our own little office um and um and so like sales reps or whatever instead of driving back to the office or whatever they needed to do their work they did at their touchdown station or they represented that area so like gg was over there 
Alex was over there, you know, and that's what, and that's what they did. And, and, and so like, I remember when I was um, trying to teach IPM to all the technicians, I was like, this is not going anywhere. I got to figure out a freaking solution. So what I did, I was like, oh, these guys are just pest control guys. They are going to be the guys who are going to you know, spray, drop the granules, sweep down the webs. We need that interaction. They, yeah. they, that service needs to get done regardless. So then what we did is we had like our, what we called our first impression team. They would do the sales, the new start, the initial yeah, service. Yeah, that's how I'm going to do it. The follow-up. Yeah, that's what I've been doing. And then what all I, we had to do was just train four people and go like, and then, we, and then it was so much better because those guys – to take the time they took the time and then they stayed on the in the company longer right right yeah, yeah. so i mean so you got a they, level one tech a level two tech a level three tech yeah and yeah. so then it was like you can send them to training and stuff and it was a good investment where it's like just technicians are just going to be technicians and it's like going no matter how much you try right i'm like you not see this window that oh i just i didn't know that the window was down it's like yeah i we've talked about this like over and over but but, and you, over but again. the thing is you you can't teach dna no you can't so so you got the guy who's like meticulous so you, and looks at everything you and find you, your charmers yeah and then you start coaching them yeah mentoring them and then they can start doing it and like those first impression guys like um like pete he is a regional manager now yeah for a big national company i don't know if they're national but they're huge right you know they're a big family-owned company based here in georgia Pretty sure you guys can figure it out. Uh, Alex, same thing. You know, I mean, they're management level now. You know, right. where, and they started out as technician. Yeah. And so you, you, you coach those gems and you just go, oh, you guys are now just, are just pest control guys. Because believe it or not, people are just happy being technicians. They're happy. Look, they're happy getting started at 9 in the morning, 7 in the morning, and being home by 3 or 4. Yeah. And being with their kids. And they don't want anything more. They, they're happy with that money. And that's fine. Yeah, yeah, but it was a long. It took forever to, to figure that out. Right. Like I didn't figure it out until like the last five years of owning the company. See, I've had that in my mind because I come from a tech. So IT is not that much different than pest control. Yeah. I mean, when you look at it, yeah. I mean, you're out servicing systems and clients and things, and I understood that mentality of a tech, and you know how you know I'm you know when I was dealing, I had to deal you know sometimes and when I had. The Salesforce, just like Salesforce, you know, you have yeah. you have your CSRs, and then you have your lead tech, and I was a national account rep, you know. So things that, like I said, from my background, it, it just came naturally to me to think that way. Text my wife real quick. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So yeah, man. Um, dang, let's do marketing. Yeah. I, I, know I, I know that's your thing. I love and marketing I suck at is it. fun. And I suck at it. I think it's just a part of like, you get to create, you get to look for opportunities, create, and you get to see the fruition. It was fun, even with natural pest control, like solving people's issues. That's fun, right? Managing the account sucks, right? right? It's like managing the team to, to do it sucks, but creating something is fun and that's what i like is like the aspect of creating stuff and i think that's why like with natural pest control it was great it was fun it was new but you Nobody have you, you have it. your you have your your artist background your theater background yeah i, I think it all plays into that oh it for yeah. sure plays into it yeah because you, you know you're not gonna you're not gonna or not everyone's gonna be happy with you right, right? but even when they go to like an improv show, you're going to have your hecklers and stuff. Yeah. But you're going to wow everybody else, right? So when you're like reading in that room, it's very fulfilling because everyone's having a good time doing it. You get your hecklers out there. And what we used to do is we used to uh, end the show. So we, we would start the improv show with a, um, a set called 99 Jokes. And we would end our show with 99 Jokes, right? And so what we would do is we would identify who the hecklers were the pain in the asses right we would bring them up on stage at the last show saying all right you guys are going to do it with us we would do the 99 jokes and then we would just walk off stage end the show leave them on stage and they couldn't do anything <laughs> right so oh, yeah. then, or, 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 or you just take the hecklers and you do an improv on something they said and you just roll with oh, you can but it's better that if they are sitting there in front of everybody going i watched this game but now i can't you know, people can talk. What's up, Scott? 
you know, it's all about pivoting and making those changes. Yeah, no, we're, we're figuring out, we got, we're pivoting a little bit now on, on a lot of things. Oh, that we always did. pivot. Yeah, it, it's starting, we know what we worked well, you know, for five, six years, um, you know, isn't working as well now. And that's why I'm having all these marketing and you know, everybody's like, I oh, know he's going to have another SEO conversation. No, isn't this a great community? It is, bro. You, you know, you don't get a lot of this in Miami. No. I got neighbors, like I try to be like neighborly to all my guys. But I got people who live there. You know your neighbors now, nah, man. I it's talk to it's about community. Yeah, today, it's, a, so it's about community. So, the, you know, the sad part about about a lot of things that I try to, like right now, I'm probably working. I'm lucky to put in forty hours a week. I'm, I'm putting in thirty something hours uh, on the actual business. A lot of the time, I'm just doing marketing. Um, and but a lot of the people just there's no time. Like my girlfriend, she gets up six in the morning and she's off and she'll drive an hour and a half and then she'll drive she'll get out of work at five and it's an hour and a half so by the time she gets home it's seven o'clock so she leaves at six in the morning and gets back at seven yeah there's no time to talk to anybody nice to meet you um it's just that kind of lifestyle that it's just so so rushed oh i want one i want another puppy yeah i do i don't know i i my my, my place is too small i need a house yeah, I got a townhouse. I mean, I, I got a big townhouse, but it's still a townhouse. Yeah, I have a, I have a big house, but it seems small. That's the crazy thing. Yeah, I want a yard. And, yeah, we're looking at buying right now, but man, we can't buy anything for anything we want that's nice, decent. I mean, this is not even you know like we're not talking about anything crazy, nine hundred k. Like we, we we had a yard like at our old house, and then we moved into another house and we we're like this is great because it's on a lake but we really don't have a yard now a backyard yeah so. yeah we've been looking at that because i want to i want a house with a pool i want a pool and lakefront so i'm being like really picky is right there now. like a parade or something happening why is it so packed i don't know you see that cake right there that's for new year's eve the cake drop see the hanging in tree yeah it's right, it's right. yeah no i got the idea man we were out here and I was like, oh man what a wonderful idea to make you know fire pit with a keg so I'm, I'm immediately online looking for a keg to order so I can get a fire, make a fire pit. Oh, wow. Because I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to modify it and I'm going to probably turn it into a little hibachi that you can sit around and, and cook have, your own steak. So I have a solo stove, uh -huh. which is like a smokeless fire pit. Yeah. And so I'll give, so, so typically what happens after a client's been with us for, on board, we'll give them like, you know, like really expensive gifts, like the solo, the Blackstone, right. all of that stuff. And they love it. But the solar stuff is like that too. You can cook, you can grill on it now. So they have pops that you can do, do it. That's why I was like, oh, hey, if we go to the house, I'll pull out the solo and chill by the lake. Yeah, because I, did, I didn't know what she wanted to do. Like we've been going oh, out, we've yeah, been going fine. out in the evening, but I said, man, you know. The, it was cold though. No, yeah, no, it was. I was outside on your the deck. Your front will be nice and warm, but your back will be nice and cold. Yeah, no, I, I, I had my, my snow jacket that I had bought when I went to Michigan like three years ago. I went to do some teaching up there. Yeah. And I bought this, you know, I haven't had winter coat since I left Ohio in 2000. Yeah. I don't know what it's like. I have sweaters, you know. Oh, I had to pull out my jackets. Yeah. So I, I, had this... I forgot that I had this one jacket. And I was like, she goes, you still got like that gray Columbia. I was like, what? And I would go, I don't even remember having this. Because it's like, I don't have to ever wear it. Yeah. No, anything, anything in the 50s, I'm comfortable with. Yeah. Anything below like 45, I'm uncomfortable with. Yeah. And it was like, it went down to like. 30, 39 that night, I was smoking a cigar out in the, on their porch, and, and I had a blanket, and I had my hands in here, and then I was listening to a Gary Vee podcast, and my girlfriend is inside and going, are you still out there? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, aren't you cold? And I said, no. <laughs> We're texting. And I'm like, I'm watching a podcast. And okay. And yeah. No, I, I, it was cold. I was like, I didn't even want to go out. So, Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a concert stage. So there's you know, yeah venues. There. So like the big one that's over there, right? We'll get like like uh, um, um, God, who's the guy who like the devil went down to Georgia? The Charlie Daniels. Charlie Daniels, yeah. I think, was, I think Charlie Daniels band played there a couple of years ago. Oh wow! But we get like big like like big names. Is that like an amphitheater? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, and it, and the city pays you know pays for it all. Oh wow! So yeah, it's nice a great. City. It, it's it's a it's a beautiful city and what it is done with I it. Mean, I mean, I I always love traveling outside of Florida. I mean, I I've always hated Miami. 
I've never liked my life. Um, just, I'm there for a reason, I guess, and I'm just enjoying that part of it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm just, right now I'm taking it, like, super easy. I mean, our numbers, the easier I take it, it seems like the numbers grow better. Uh, yeah. Uh, because I'm not, like, trying to force things. Does it, does, so parts of Miami just need to be revitalized. Is well, that... Miami is really revitalized. I mean, a lot of like... it is very modern, very revitalized. But it's just too many people. Right. I mean, to get away to the country, it's like I got to drive two it's hours, far. you know, to get out of the country. Yeah. Um, to get, you know, into, you know, I thought about buying some land out in the middle of, you know, like where Lake Okeechobee is. And then just dropping a, uh, a container home on it. Just yeah. so I can get away. I mean, you you should like talk to Luke Lewis, man. He and Josh Alfred, man, they both created a business where they can manage yeah. it. Yeah, me and Luke talk all the time. Yeah, me and Luke, we, we we don't talk as much as we used to because he's swamped. Yeah, uh, you know his thing has grown nuts. But I was there with him when he was when that crazy time. You know, yeah. I, I I've I've seen the companies that have grown and had to go through that just massive amount of growing pains that I don't have the stomach for anymore. I, I don't have that. I don't have that. Yeah. That fortitude to deal with that amount of stress. Um, yeah. It just, so I'm growing it differently, a little slower, but with really high margins, you know, and, and we've got a system. I'm, I wanted to, I want to have a presence in a lot of markets, um, but I don't nearly want to have like, I, I don't think I want 40 tags. I didn't have, well, yeah, I didn't have 40 tags. I, you know, I glued well, my office I don't want 20. Now. Okay, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's just not for me. Like, you I, know, I, I, I'm enjoying the lifestyle that it provides for me. And so, then, so yeah. if I can grow to six to eight tags, because I'm, 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 I'll I'm tell people happy. a lot of the time I go, yeah, I was a successful company. I go, so I feel like I was successful, but then times I feel like I failed as a business owner, right? Because it's like, I didn't own, I didn't want that responsibility of like managing everybody, or I didn't want that responsibility of having Have to Have you be, thought about just be, at that time, or maybe, you know, you had a lot of things going like I did. I had to take a, basically a, a little sabbatical. I'm taking a sabbatical now. Like I said, I'm working about 30 hours a week. Uh, I'm still, but I'm, I'm putting things in perspective where you could have been the CMO of the company and said, Hey, I'm like me. I don't feel like being the I, I, CEO. I, I don't think I, like I thought about that and I just felt like I took it as far as I can go. And it was time for me to do something different. Got it. Cause I, I, I went to like a workshop in Vegas and I was like, I need to reignite myself. Right. And I left there going, yeah, I don't want that. Right. I don't want that at all. You know? Right. Um, and plus, you know, I was, you know, like people like Dan Nielsen or something like that. Like I met him there and he kept getting hosed over with his marketing companies. Yeah, that's the same thing I have. That's and, why I want to build my in-house one. Yeah. Now I was going, let me help you out. And I built him a website for free because I was like, oh, it'll give me something to do, you know. And give me give me like a company to, to play with and like design stuff. Right. Right. And I did that. And then it. Then another one like reached, and I was like, I don't know. I kind of like own a pest control. I don't have time uh, to do that. And then it just got to the point where I was like, I'm done. I'm just so done with it. Like it right. just wasn't fun anymore. I've seen a lot of owners that own different businesses and they got to that same point. I mean, a lot of them, you know, just recluded, you know, they became really reclusive. Yes. It, it, it happens. Yes. I mean, I found myself doing that. It got so, but I was going through so much at the same time and and they become like hell i just rather become a pastor i was i was very reclusive <laughs> yeah like i mean i like exited a lot of things right thank god for you know people like scott sawyer and stuff like who were consistent in my life because yeah. you know because without him like oh hey man we're i'm uh, let's go out and i'm like ah he's like i'm in your driveway and i'm like damn it scott you know it's like right. it's, so then he, you know because you know because i mean he, he understands what it's like Running the business. Yeah, you burned out. I mean, yeah, you, you it, burned out. You it got really, the life. It's it, it burnout. It burnout. It, and for me, it was the chronic exhaustion, the chronic fatigue, the the medical issues, the stress. And I said, now nah, let me rethink how I want to do things. Yeah. And 
and like I said, I, I enjoy, but I enjoy, I enjoy the teaching part and the training part and the development part of people more than I actually enjoy growing a business. Right. I just don't enjoy the business growth aspect of business. Um, so that's why I want to do the academy. That's why I want to start doing local uh, technical training and you, like the academy, like CEU. Yeah, like CEU academies um, locally. I already got it built out. I mean, I, I'm waiting on one class. I'm going to record over this new week. I wanted to launch it January first, and I'm going to register all those classes. The state starting in January, and start doing local CEU training with guys that like uh, via video or I, I want to do. I'm going to do both. Let's turn this off. Let's talk business.